that he who has the knowledge rules the airwaves. So guess who? Ha <laughs> ha! That is still one of the worst in Doctor Who impersonations I think I've done ever. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Absolutely Completely Random Podcast for Saturday, January 21st, 2017. It's my best friend's birthday today. Happy birthday, Andrew Gaiman. Uh, you know, turns 28 today. Happy birthday, buddy. Woo! So, yeah, a lot to do this week, a lot to talk about, and oh man, oh man, do I have a lot of stuff to do. I got my article list by my side here, I've got the articles in front of me, I have Doctor Who stuck in my head thanks to the clips of my not favorite Doctor the 11th that were playing almost all day on YouTube that I could find, and ALF stuck in my head because I've been watching that all week with my grandfather. But this week I'm going to be talking about Shout Factory. Getting the license for the first three Digimon Adventure Try movies. I'm talking about Makoto Shinkai's blessed second coming of Japan movie, Your Name Finally Surpassing Spirited Away. I called that one, folks. Woohoo, did I call that? It is now the highest grossing uh, Japanese film of all time, the animated, I should say. I'm talking about the opening for Excel World vs. SAO. Two light novels coming together in one beautiful harmony. And my God, was it beautiful. And then I'm going right on the complete 180 of that to the Power Rangers second trailer, which is officially the final nail in its coffin, ladies and gentlemen. It's time to lower it into the ground, start playing Danny Boy, and pouring the concrete on top. It ain't coming back from the dead. And I'm also going to be, unfortunately, talking about Ringling Brothers shutting down after all these years. That's right, folks. The greatest show on earth is unfortunately coming to an end. And it's really sad. That and so, so much more this week to talk about. But first, like always, if you're in the mood for trading cards, anime, games, DVDs, movies, toys, collectibles, what have you, check out all lowercase, by the way, A R H O A D S hyphen 2012 on eBay. That's A Roads 2012 on eBay. I have a lot of that stuff. And they make great gifts. They make great conversation starters. They make those great little oddity things for things you don't even know existed. What have you? So check that out on eBay. I'm once again all lowercase. A-R-H-O-A-D-S hyphen 2012. You can also follow me on Twitter at Otaku Roads. So this week, uh, for me, has been a hell of a lot of fun. Uh, we did inventory at work on Thursday, which I, anybody that's ever worked retail, you know how boring that is. You're basically fighting to keep yourself awake. Um, I hope to never have to do it again, but I don't see that ever happening. I've also been watching Alf with my grandfather most of the week. So that was fun. He really likes that little alien guy. On top of that, I have been researching stuff. I have been looking up other stuff. I've had basically a fun week. Um, and that's kind of going to segue into my first thing here uh, that I didn't mention at the start of this. I got the last two um, DVD sets that I need to complete my David Tennant Doctor Who collection. Now, for those of you unfamiliar, um, and I know I've said this multiple times here on the podcast, David Tennant is my favorite. Favorite of the Doctors up to now. And I know Peter Capaldi's still doing it. He should be the 12th or 13th if you count the War Doctor, which I don't. I don't really think anybody does. But David Tennant, who, is, who played the 10th Doctor, is my all-time favorite. And... It was ironic because that's what got me started on the whole getting the Doctor Who discs. Um, when the series restarted back in 2005, everybody knows that uh, Christopher Eccleston was the one that played the Doctor for that one year. In 2006, um, David Tennant took over and lasted for a damn good long time. And what annoyed me was that uh, last year, with a friend's help, I managed to get the fourth series, which would have been season four, but you have to remember this is a British show. So they do series, not seasons, and I managed to finally get season four, or series four, thinking, oh, cool, it's going to have the ending of Doctor Who. I'm finally going to see how this ends. Only to find out, no, if you want to see how the David Tennant era comes to an end, eh, good luck with that you got to buy the complete specials. 
And when I found this out, I started cursing at the top of my at the top of my lungs. I mean, I was pissed. So uh, tracking that down was not easy. I finally managed to find it tonight happily, and I got it because I've been searching long and hard for that, and the price was finally right. And on top of that, just to finally put the nail in this one and go, it's done. Uh, I also got the complete second season. So I now have the start of the David Tennant era and the end of the David Tennant era and everything in between, including what originally started my journey back in 2015 with the getting of Series 3 at, ironically, a Sam's Club. <laughs> go figure on that one. Uh, and that's how I got, that's how I started because I found both of those and I'm like, oh, this is really cool. This is Doctor Who. And I thought, well, I'll put it up for sale on eBay. And then I'm like, oh, you know what? I think I'm actually just going to watch it, see what all the hype's about. Oh, man, is it good. Um, but that kind of segues into this. If you want to collect from certain seasons of the newer ones, because the older ones, it's kind of easy. In my opinion, it's easy, but I could be wrong about this. Don't shoot me if I am. But, um... It could be easy if you want to collect, like, let's say, um, certain ones. Because the majority of those are coming out on DVD. They are actually of somewhat good quality. But you have to remember that there are still some that are missing yet or that the film was highly old and it's degraded, and you're not going to get that. Um, a lot of the Patrick Troughton ones, a lot of the uh, William Hartnell ones. I think there might be a couple of the John Pertwees, and that would be the first three Doctors right there. Hartnell was the first, Troughton was the second, Pertwee was the third. I know a majority of the Tom Baker ones are out. I've seen those on uh, eBay. I've seen a lot of the uh, Peter Davison ones, the Colin Baker ones, and Sylvester McCoy, who's my second favorite Doctor, by the way. Uh, I know the Christopher Eccleston one's out because... Uh, my friend said that I should get that one. I'm like, oh, yeah, I can uh, not only get that, I can look for and complete my Christopher Eccleston collection of Doctor Who in one fell swoop because he's only did one season, and, oh, look, I can get that in one shot. Uh, so I'm probably going to do it at some point. Um, then you got David Tennant, like I just said, and I just finished my collection off tonight, so when they arrive, I will be 100% done. Uh, now, the only thing with that is if I really want to get anal about this, and have every single Doctor Who that he was in, I'd have to get Day of the Doctor. The only downside with that is it kind of plays more into the 11th Doctor's role and not the 10th. So it's kind of on my, if I really want to get this, I'm being anal about it. Yeah, that figures. But it's true. I'm, it's true. That's the whole thing. So it's my, uh, it's my idea um, I might, might not, I don't know. Then you have the 11th Doctor, who pretty much had from Series 5, 6, and 7, because Series 8 started Peter Capaldi's run, and he is now, I believe, starting Series 10. Uh, by the way, uh, if anybody from the BBC is listening, um, I would love to play Doctor Who. Um, 15th Doctor? There could be a couple in between. I'll be the 15th. I wouldn't mind that. Give, another, give an American another shot. The last one we had was the 8th Doctor for that god-awful movie. Come on, give another American a shot. You never know, we might be good at it. And I watch Doctor Who. Just make up science terms and... I could just quote John Pertwee's thing if I don't understand it. Just reverse the polarity of the neutron flow. I mean, come on, I could do this. <coughs> but either way... um, yeah, if you want to collect something, especially with something like this, it's a pain in the neck sometimes, but checking it out on eBay and all that is a good way of doing it. Like I said, if I really want to get anal completing my David Tennant collection of it, I'd have to get Day of the Doctor. But that's sort of a, do I really feel like it? And it'll be like a, eh, after a long amount of soul searching, and do I really want to do this back and forth in my head? Now, another thing, though, I've been trying to get my hands on lately, collecting-wise, has been Warehouse 13. I've been close twice, only to have it escape my grasp, because nobody wants to make a freaking deal on eBay! I know that there's a buy-it-now or best offer. That means I give you what I think it's worth, or what I'm willing to pay, or anybody's even willing to pay, and then you think about it. I can understand if you want to decline it, but when you're only, like, maybe... 
X amount of dollars apart from each other, are you really going to argue about that if it means, oh, look, I'll have a sale. That's positive feedback. That could help me sell down the road. But I can understand it. I mean, I've done the same. I I've rejected a few offers myself, um, mostly because the person really wanted to lowball me, and I wasn't having any of that. So, yeah, but either way, it's not too bad. But let's get into the podcast, folks. Let's get on to my next topic, Shout Factory. That's right, folks. The lovely people at Shout Factory. Just perfect nostalgia, I think, for this. And I just kind of, this kind of segued perfectly into this. I did a good job fixing this up this morning, uh, what I was going to talk about. Um, Shout Factory, as a lot of people know, um, is the sort of matriarch now for busting out older shows and putting them on DVD. They are making a huge name for themselves. Well, their name's about to get a hell of a lot bigger because they got the licenses for the first three Digimon Adventure Tri films. That's right, folks. Uh, they plan a home video digital release of the films with English subtitles as well as the English dub. The North America Media Company and Toei Animation announced this on Tuesday that they acquired the North American Broadcast and Home Entertainment distribution rights to the first three films in the six-part Digimon Adventure Tri film series. Shout Factory plans to release the films with both the Japanese and English audio on DVD and Blu-ray discs, and also digitally through electronics sell through, you know, sell through EST distribution. I never liked those um, EST distributions, mostly because if it ends up glitching or something, you've paid for it, now you're screwed with it. Or if the download crap sometimes is like one download per transaction, which kind of annoys me. I mean, if it's only like a dollar, okay, sure, I'll waste another dollar to try to download the damn thing. But for something like this, it's not going to be that cheap. Uh, in my opinion, and I will always stand by this, I understand the need to have everything digital because, you know, less space. And if you think about it, the more the world advances, the less stuff everybody accumulates. I mean, at first you had beta, then it went to VHS, and then VHS went to DVD, DVDs go into Blu-ray, and Blu-rays basically go into the cloud. Though I prefer to have DVD because I think that's actually a hell of a lot better in my opinion. But still. But um, I could see you know the point of having stuff electronic, but this is when it comes to movies and that TV shows, I kinda like the being able to watch it on a TV. With the DVD player, I kind of like that. So, that's something I would approve a lot more. But, uh, back to the article. Uh, Shout Factory said that they do plan to release the first film, uh, Digimon Adventure Try Chapter 1 Reunion, sometime this year. The company described the film as follows, which is basically just a cut and paste in the article. It was just a cut and paste from any wiki site, I think. Um, okay, here we go. Uh, Reunion picks up where the beloved Digimon Adventure series from 2002 ended. It's been six years since that summer adventure when Ty, now in high school by the way, and the rest of the Digidestin crossed over to the digital world, and nearly three years since the frenzied final battle between warring fractions. With the gate to the digital world closed, time continues to pass until the adventure digivolves once again. Uh, Shout Factory's release of this the first film, uh... It's going to include the already produced English dub that ran in the theaters in the United States and Canada last year. Anybody remembers that? There's a whole bunch of things on there. Eleven Arts and Toei had screened the English dub version of the film in more than 300 theaters in the United States and Canada on September 15th, with more screenings added later on in the month. Uh, never anywhere around where I live, sadly, but then again, I could just watch the damn thing online at that point with subs. So I, I just think I just did that for... Some of it, and then got tired, fell asleep because I was a little sleepy that day, and then didn't bother watching it again. So I should watch those. Uh, Crunchyroll started streaming them, all three of the films, on the same day they opened in Japan. The fourth film in this project, now out of the six, so we're only on number four here. Um, Digimon Adventure Try, Loss. I'm not, it's like Show Shitsu. Loss uh, will open in Japan on February 25th. Woohoo! Uh, Digimon Adventure Tri Project celebrates the 15th anniversary of Digimon, uh, the Digimon Adventure, the first entry in the series. So I know it went Digimon Adventure, then Digimon Adventure 02, then it was Digimon, and it was uh, Digimon Tamers, 
And I think it was Battle Frontier, or Digimon Frontier, and I don't remember what Data Squad was called over in Japan, and then I know it was uh, X-Cross in uh, Japan was what Digimon Fusion was called, which, by the way, that would have done a lot better had it actually finished here in the U.S. Um, Digimon Adventure Try Chapter 1 opened in Japan on November 25th, uh, November 2015. Second film, uh, Determination, opened on March 12th. That would have been 2016 then. The third and most recent film, uh, Chapter 3 Confession, opened on September 24th. And now you have number four coming out February 25th. So, figuring out this timeline should be easy. Uh, based on this, I'd estimate that number five will probably come out somewhere near October. I want to say... Let's go six months. Uh, okay, I see August or September. Number five. So then add six months from both of those. Be about February, March of next year. Maybe the last one will come out. So you never know. So, there you go. So, if you're interested in the first three, you'll be able to soon get them from Shout Factory, at least the first one. The other two will be on their way, and then the other ones will probably be on their way once they get the licenses for those. So, that's really neat to know. You know, if you're a fan of Digimon, you want to know what happens next. I know the first one's really good because they had Alphamon in it. And the last time we saw Alphamon was if you watched um, Digimon X Evolution, which, by the way, uh, if you can watch that online, I recommend it. That is very well done for CG. That is beautiful. The st it's in it's subbed, unfortunately. It's only uh, dubbed in Japanese. It's not dubbed in English. Uh, and if there is an English one out there, it's like a fan sub. It's like a fan dub of it. It is. I, I highly recommend it for any Digimon fan. That is a good movie. I mean, that is really well done. I like it a lot. So yeah. Let's move on. Alright, so who remembers the Galaxy Note 7s? Samsung's disastrous bath that they took to a tune of, I think it was at least 500 mil? At least? Well, you want to know why it exploded? Here we go. I found this article. It was first published on January 16th of this year. And it was updated uh, a few days afterwards then. But basically said about why it exploded. Samsung company said in October it will explain, will examine all aspects of the phone. Yeah, right. Uh, Samsung, so I'm just going to read it straight from the article because I didn't get a chance to actually read the article itself. So here we go. Uh, Samsung Electronics Corporated LTD, I never understand what that stood for. Uh, investigation into what caused some Galaxy Note 7 smartphones to catch fire. Some? <coughs> some? I just want to pause here for a second. Some? Um, I kind of remember it being a lot of those, but okay, yeah, sure, we'll go with some. Okay, uh, they wanted to know what caused some Galaxy Note 7 smartphones to catch fire. Has concluded that the battery was the main reason. No shit, Sherlock's! Really? You don't say? Like with the laptops catching fire all those years ago? You don't say it was the battery? Oh. Okay, the world's biggest smartphone maker is seeking to put behind one of its biggest product safety failures. <laughs> yeah. Uh, in tech history as it prepares to launch the Galaxy S8. That's right, folks. The new Galaxy S8's coming. You know what that means? Absolutely nothing. <laughs> at least as far as I know, because a new phone comes out almost every year. It's They're like toilet paper at this rate. You're soon going to be able to just go to a department store and get a roll of iPhones, take them home, put them next to your toilet, take off a couple, and just wipe yourself with them. That's how many of those are coming out nowadays. Every time they come out with a new one, oh, it's time to get rid of the old one now. What do we do with all these extra ones? Eh, I don't know. There's an idea. It's going to hurt. It's not going to be pleasant, but that's an idea. But anyway, um, they're preparing to launch the Galaxy S8, one of its flagship phones, sometime in the first half of this year. <laughs> okay. All right. 
Uh, investors and analysts say it's critical for Samsung to provide a convincing and detailed explanation about what went wrong with the Note 7. Well, where should we start? Uh, fire, fire, and more fire. Uh, oh, yeah, and more fire. Let's see, how much more fire did we have again? Oh, yeah, a lot. <laughs> Uh, they also want to know how it will prevent such problems from recurring if it is to regain consumer trust. Uh, screw consumer trust. I think that's pretty much out the door at this point. Uh, I actually own an LG phone. I don't think I own anything Samsung anymore, to be honest with you. I know my, I think my my phone's LG. Yeah, my phone. Yeah, my tra little track phone's an LG. I don't think I actually own anything Samsung anymore, to be honest with you. So yeah, I think. Oh no 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 no. Hold that thought. My camera, my camera is Samsung. I forgot about that. My digital camera is Samsung. I forgot about that little guy. I haven't had any problems with that. So that's good. I forgot all about that. So, okay. Um, in a quote from... Let me see if I get the thing on here. Okay, in a quote from Brian M.A., Singapore-based an uh, analyst for, research, for researcher IDC... He said they've got to make sure they come clean and they've got to reassure buyers as to why this won't happen again. So in other words, basically just come out and go, oh, well, the phone caught fire. How do we plan to not have this happen again? Read our press statement. I don't mean to sound cynical about any of this, but when it comes to tech companies, a lot of this stuff, when they're told that they have to come clean about something, that's the time when I kind of start getting the salt and just start getting a tablespoon. Because it's never going to end well. Uh, it's almost like every single time I've ever seen something like this, it's never ended well for anybody involved. But uh, here's more of the article yet. Uh, still going on. The results of the investigation will likely be announced on January 23rd, which is two days from today. Uh, one day, for those of you that will actually be listening to this podcast, I keep forgetting that. I recorded on a Saturday, and it's uploaded on a Sunday, folks. So, there you go. Uh, a day before it announces detailed fourth quarter earning results. <laughs> Sorry, I just had to laugh there. They're going to announce uh, fourth quarter earnings. Memory serves the fourth quarter would have included the Galaxy Note 7's failure. So, can't be that high. Shouldn't take too long. Uh, said the person who was not authorized to speak publicly on the matter and declined to be identified. So, in other words, it's, oh, well, um, this is what I can say about it. Oh, but uh, I don't can't speak publicly to you about it and uh yeah you can't you, i'm just an anonymous figurehead so in other words you're just gonna go looking around the company now and going so which one of you guys blabbed to the press <sighs> this is this article and like i said this is uh my actual reaction to this because i have not gotten a chance to read this article so you're getting a nice treat here tonight folks so uh here we go uh kong dung jin and i'm not making that name up Head of Samsung's mobile business will likely announce the results as well as new measures the firm is taking to prevent similar problems in future devices, the person said. A Samsung person declined to comment. Samsung initially announced a recall of some 2.5 million Note 7 phones in September and identified the cause of the fire as a malfunctioning process problem at one of its suppliers, later identified as affiliate Samsung SID Co. LTD, which I never understood what the LTD stood for. I'm really sorry about that. But new Note 7s with what Samsung said were safe batteries from a different supplier continued to catch fire, forcing the company to permanently halt sales of the device and dealing a 6.1 trillion won. Ooh. Or 5.2 billion. Let's just, wait, hold on. Let's just do this right. Let's, let, let me do this right. 5.2 billion. <laughs> uh, below to Samsung's operating profit over three quarters. So, uh, IDC's MA said the following. 
Uh, to me, I'd be surprised if they said it was a supplier issue. Or it'd be surprising. Yeah, adding he suspects Samsung may not have given enough room for the battery inside the phone. That's possible. I mean, batteries do expand. Stuff expands when it gets warm. Let's all take a moment here and go to and go to Professor Andrews' classroom for a moment, boys and girls, when I can give you a little bit of education in this podcast this week. And I know I'm acting really silly. I'm just in a good mood tonight. So, let's go to Professor Andrews' classroom. Today, I'm talking about none other than... Ready? Ready for this, boys and girls? I am talking about... Thermal conduction! Now... Do you know what this means? Well, let me give you the layman's term for it. If you heat something up, it expands. If you chill it or freeze it, it contracts. That's one of the reasons why when you suck down a slushy or an icy really super fast, you get brain freeze. You're constricting the blood vessels in your brain. And that's why when you drink something regular like bottled water or even just regular water... You take care of it because then it's giving the contracted artery a chance to slowly expand back. Speaking of water, I'm drinking a Deer Park tonight, for those of you wondering. So, there you have it. That was Professor Andrew's classroom. So, there's still more yet. (laughs) Uh, The company in October said it will examine all aspects of the phone. Yeah, right including hardware design and software, and would hire third-party firms as part of its probe. So, let me get this straight. We took a $5.2 billion bath, and we're just going to hire a third-party company that's probably just going to send us a massive bill for sitting around and uh, chilling out at a desk, not really doing much of anything, when a moron in a tracksuit could probably solve this for you. Uh, better yet, let's just get Batman on this. I'm not a fan of Batman, so let's just get Batman on this. Have him use his supercomputer. He'll solve it in five seconds. It'll cost you about half a billion dollars for that. Oh, God. Um, the source told uh, Rudders on Monday that Samsung was able to replicate the fires during its investigation and that the cause for the fires could not be explained by hardware design or software-related matters. No shit. Uh, While prospects for its smartphone business this year remain a major question mark for Samsung, profits are expected to rise sharply on the back of rising memory chip prices and growing sales of organic light-emitting diode screens for smartphones. You're wondering what that noise was. I'm banging my head on the microphone for this. This has got to be a joke. So Samsung's basically going to be making money doing everything but smartphones. Here's an idea. Don't do smartphones. You obviously don't have what it takes. You just took a massive bath. And you're just going to jump. I mean, I understand the whole adage of getting back on the bull that threw you. Get right back up on the horse and all that. You took a $5.2 billion blow. If I were to take a $5.2 billion blow in a company, that's like taking a sledgehammer to my nuts. It it, it don't feel good. (laughs) In any way, shape, or form, it does not feel good. But all right, you know what? Let them have their fun. Let them do what they want to do. They're going to get screwed either way. All right. Who remembers Makoto Shinkai's Your Name? Who remembers it being one of the biggest films of all time? Well, get ready, folks, because you can actually tell your kids and your grandkids and maybe your great-grandkids. You never know. Medical science is really improving. People could live to be a 1,000 years old. You never know. That Makoto Shinkai's Your Name was officially the highest-grossing Japanese film of all time worldwide. And it hasn't even been released in America yet. The film, which has been which has seen huge ticket sales, not only in Japan, but in countries like China and South Korea, which amazes me, 
uh, has made over $280 million worldwide, all before the film has ever been released here in America. And by the way, I'm still looking forward to that. The majority of Your Name's box office has come from Japan, where it has earned almost $200 million. That's $23 billion yen, and become the second highest grossing domestically produced film of all time. But the film has also earned over $82 million in China and $17 million in South Korea, as well as around $1 million in Thailand, France, and Australia. Holy crap, that's huge. The previous record holder, are you ready for this, folks? Here we go. The previous record holder, now bumped down to second place, was Studio Ghibli's very classic and I highly recommend it movie, Spirited Away, which made $274 million worldwide. The film remains the highest gross seed ever in Japan, though. Okay? That's, yeah. So Spirited Away is still the highest grossing film in Japan. However, worldwide, it got bumped down to second place. When you throw the U.S. into this mix, it might be a whole different ballgame. But as for now, it's bumped down to second place. Funimation announced on Wednesday it would release Your Name in America, both dubbed and subtitled April 7th. Woohoo! Which means I finally get to watch this thing! As long as it's going to be like on DVD or in theaters or something, I am looking forward to that. So, woohoo! I'll quote Homer. Woohoo! I'm looking forward to that. So, that's a big deal. Because remember, this is a movie that just completely goes eight nuts over this. People have been going crazy about this movie. The creator's been getting uh, complaints from other creators. I think it's just jealousy, personally. They're pissed because they couldn't come up with something this good. So let's just trash talk the person that's doing what we can't do. It's classic. You don't even need to have a psychologist degree to figure that one out. But either way, congratulations, Makoto Shinkai. Your name is officially the highest grossing Japanese film of all time worldwide. And that deserves the Andrew pat on the back and hands of appreciation. Woohoo! You did it, man. You did it. Congratulations. I mean that. Congratulations. Okay, so I'd like to take this moment quick in my podcast to once again wish my buddy Andrew Gaiman a happy birthday. Uh, if I'm right about the age, because he's the same age as I am, he's 28 then today, so he'll be a year older than I am for... Well, he'll be older than I am till uh, August, so... <laughs> I'm catching up, buddy. I'm catching up. So, uh, once again, happy birthday and a special shout-out once again this week to Ian Ferguson. Ian, saw your po- uh, saw your Twitter post. Hope you're doing good. Glad things are improving a little bit. So I did check your uh, thing to see how much it was up to. Uh, I did not check it today, though. Unfortunately, I was a little busy with some other stuff. But, hey, you know, hope you're doing well. Hope you're doing better. You know, looking forward to you returning to the podcast and... Just a special note to Pat Contry, uh, as I think some of your fans may have said this um, with this past podcast, but next time you record an hour-long video for uh, the Nintendo Switch or any Nintendo product or any game product and you're talking about it, little piece of advice, at least I, I want to give some criticism at this point if I can, just to say that I did. Um, next time... Just put, like, snippets of it into the podcast and not just uh, piss-whip the whole hour program in there. I was an entire hour I had to fast-forward through the podcast because I already watched your video on the Switch presentation. So, yeah. Come on, man. Just want to get that out there. So let's get back to the articles and back to my podcast. Let's get back to the absolutely completely random podcast or the ACR podcast, whichever you prefer. All right. Trigger produced Kieran commercial pulled after complaints. This article is courtesy of Otaku USA, by the way, ladies and gentlemen. For those of you unfamiliar with what this is, uh, even I'm not sure. But I like the tagline that they had at the. Uh, author put in this, uh, Matt Shunley. 
uh, put in this. I really like this. Uh, trigger ad gets kill a killed. <laughs> That's kind of good. Uh, last summer, Kill a Kill and Little Witch Academia Studio Trigger teamed up with alcoholic beverage producer Kieran. That's right, folks. To produce an internet exclusive ad for one of Kieran's drinks. So let's just stop here for a second and just think for a moment how this is a bad thing. We have an anime title, which one of those could probably be watched by a toddler, the other one, not so much, or even little kids. And you're going to make a beer commercial. I don't give a crap if it's for the internet. You're making a beer commercial. Okay. Let's keep going. This is from the article. Uh, now that ad has been pulled from Karen's official site, apparently due to complaints. Really? No shit. Uh, the commercial, which is still viewable on YouTube, thanks to the third taste of a third party upload. In other words, thank you, YouTube nerds and YouTube uploading trolls who took the time and effort to find a way to copy this off the first site and put it up on YouTube so it'll be forever shaming the company for generations to come. Bravo! Bravo! I mean this! Bravo! 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 Bravissimo! That's right! Bravissimo! Yes! Bravissimo! <laughs> Alright, so... It gets worse from here, folks. Trust me, it gets way, way worse from this. So, it's a short story. Yeah, it's a short story about a group of friends who all like to unwind and watch Trigger's Space Patrol, Luluko, with a can of hoiketsu, a fruit-flavored shoichu-based drink. Ask, a nonprofit dedicated to preventing alcohol and drug problems, took issue with the commercial. However, with the reasoning that advertising alcohol, or however, with the reasoning, yeah, I did that right the first time, I apologize, uh, that advertising alcoholic beverages with anime appeal to people under the legal drinking age. In other words, if you're under 21 in the U.S., I can only use the U.S. for an example because I don't know what the drinking age is in Japan. If you're under 21 here in the U.S., excuse me for a second. Sorry about that. I still have allergies every now and then. I get dust that kicks up. So um, if you're under the legal drinking age here in the U.S., you would better not be watching these commercials. But then again, this was online. So... That kind of opens up a thing which I'll get into in a moment. Uh, the group apparently collected enough signatures to convince Kieran to pull the ad from the web. Whoa! You mean to tell me a petition actually worked? Well, it must not have been a change.org one. Those things never work. Uh, Kieran had required age verification to view the ad, which Ask claimed was ineffective. Now, this is the part that I want to get into from that I was talking about. So let's talk about this. This, they required age verification. Anybody that has ever seen a news article or knows somebody that has gone to an adult website, and you know what I'm talking about, porn stars, strippers, uh, amateurs, what have you, they have a thing, under 18, over 18. You're supposed to click one of those two buttons. Here's the thing. It never works. Mostly for the fact that everyone's going to lie. They are just going to click the button that says they're over 18. How do you know this? It's human nature. But on top of that, it's a computer. It's not like it can see you, know you're lying, and just stop you from doing it. It's a piece of machinery. No offense to my laptop who's listening to this right now and probably giving me death glares. But it's all it is. It is a piece of machinery. What is it going to do to stop me? Is it just going to shut down the browser? No. It won't do anything until I tell it to do something. Because that is the power that I, the user, have over the computer. 
it annoys me because that was their only security system for this. You have an entire ad based on the anime appeal that you're using to sell alcohol. And you put an age verification to view the ad online, which any moron can easily bypass. Kieran, the Kieran company, you've basically just been awarded the dunce cap of the millennium. I don't think there's been a company since the year 2000 started. Since the 2000s even began. That was as stupid as you. I don't see it possible. None whatsoever. I mean, dear God. I What were you thinking? Ugh. Stupid people and stupid worlds, I'm telling you. All right. Let's move on to a more happier topic. Excel World versus Sword Art Online game shows off its opening. The two light novel series are basically going to collide in March. And I got to admit this, the opening was great. Uh, I did like it a lot. Uh, so here we go. Uh, this article was from Otaku USA again. The universes of Excel World and Sword Art Online will collide in Japan on March 16th when the appropriately titled Excel World vs. Sword Art Online game hits PlayStation 4 and PS Vita. Oh, wow, the Vita's still a thing, huh? Oh, okay. In addition to bringing the characters from two of light novel author Riki Kawahara's most notable series together, which, by the way, this is amazing... Uh, the theme song singers of the anime adaptations have teamed up to perform the SXW Soul World theme. So, it's really cool. Uh, I can tell you what the trailer was. It was pretty, because I'm not about to try to put it up here, copyright issues and all that fun shit. Uh, I don't want to get sued and my channel taken down. So... Here's how it basically went. It's uh, Kirito is taking on um, I can't think of her name. The one that um, Crow basically got with. The one that had feelings for him. The one that proves that you can be a short little fat guy. You can be fat and ugly and you'll still get the hot girl. Uh, she's taking on Kirito and he's basically matching blow for blow with her. They're clinging. Her arm swords are clinging and Colliding with his twin swords. It was beautiful. You have Asuna taking on Crow. You have the Red um, King, I think is what her name was. Take, you know, just shooting off rockets. I didn't see, um, I didn't see the other guy that they had from, uh, I can't even think of any of the characters from Excel World, and I've actually watched that series. Um, but it was pretty cool. I didn't see the blue guy from Excel World, and I didn't see any of the other characters. So you at least get Asuna and Kirito, which is pretty good. Um, it seemed like uh, Yui got kidnapped from the trailer, from what I can understand. Yui got kidnapped, meaning that all hell's breaking loose. And you know if anything happens to Yui, Kirito and Asuna are going to go batshit crazy on whoever is even touching her. They're just going to drop them like a sack of potatoes. They're, they'll be done. But anyway, uh, they pretty much took on... It looked like this um, evil entity sort of deal, and that's where the trailer kind of ended with both sets of teams just staring up at it like, all right, we're going to work together and take this thing down. Um, I'm looking forward to this. Well, I'm looking forward to watching Let's Plays of it. This is definitely going to be entertaining, definitely worthwhile. Hell, you know what? Maybe I'll have a Vita by then. Maybe I'll have a system I can play this on. You know, Hell would have to freeze over, and I think... Um, the devil's going to be giving some free sleigh rides, but yeah, I still think it'd be pretty cool. So I'm looking forward to seeing it when it comes out. I uh, highly recommend if you get a chance, check out the trailer or check out the opening for it. Uh, it's very well done. I think it's beautiful. So yeah, check it out. 
All right, so let's go to the complete 180 of a good trailer, and let's put the final touches on the burial of the Power Rangers movie before it even comes out in theaters. Let's not even give it the chance to suck as bad as it's going to. The second trailer for Power Rangers has officially aired on YouTube, and oh my god, does it open up a whole buttload of questions. For starters... Uh, Alpha 5 sounds like a robot from a science fiction movie set back in the 80s. Zordon is still looks like a giant floating head on a Jumbotron, but they kind of touched up the effects, I think, from what from the uh, early experience shot was that uh, we nerds were exposed to thanks to that Reddit user. They kind of... Um, he looks like one of those little things you would stick around your hand, and you would see your hand in the impression of the pegs. He looks like that extending from a wall. And it's, oh yeah, just a head. Uh, you have the Rangers being told by Zordon that the Power Rangers are warriors. Correct me if I'm wrong here, oh floating head one, but the Power Rangers were and always have been defenders, not warriors. They defend peace. They don't go out there at your beck and call and take over stuff. All right, but I'll go with what? Uh, the movie based, the trailer, I should say, basically opened with um, the five teenagers saying about how they would have never been together. It's, they think it's fate and destiny and all that fun BS. I don't know which one of the two, which character was that's there with her little brother's and it's being asked, well, where were you last night? Oh, uh, four friends and I found an alien spacecraft. I think I'm a superhero now. And all of a sudden, the parent just slams the cup down on the table and says, pee in this cup. Okay. So I take it this has got to be getting a PG rating then. Because there's no way this thing's getting a... This thing's not getting out of there with at least a PG PG-13 is probably even going to get probably like the mi mi ah, the minimum it'll get. I think I'm being generous with the PG. It's probably going to be PG-13. Because you got the violence from the Zord battle. Which, by the way, I'm not looking forward to that. I'm not going to see this one, by the way. I'm not even going to go... I I'm not even going to darken the doorway of the theaters that this thing's going to be in. And it's going to get killed anyway because there's two movies that come out. One be one a week before, one the week after. And there's even a third if you want to count the one the week of that it com that comes out. So, yeah. This movie's going to get killed at the box office. But I just can't take this anymore. I mean, uh, Zordon training the Rangers. I never remember seeing any of that in the TV show because they instantly got the knowledge from the suits. And... That is something you could definitely piece in with this movie because, let's face it, the suits are the Rangers. They're basically metamorphosizing armor to the outside of their body from within, if you think about it. At least from what I've gathered from the trailer, the power coin is basically just metamorphosing the armor within the Rangers and bringing it out to the surface. That's all it's doing. So... The Rangers should then have the knowledge built into them to fight. Nope, we gotta go through this training crap. So there's definitely gonna end up being a training montage. Because you had at least five shots of them training. Uh, there was one where they were battling some, what, the one thought were holographic putties, and they're not. You have them running up a mountainside, running, uh, doing parkour on top of a train, doing some karate on top of a train, some martial arts. I don't see this panning out well for anybody involved, and I mean that. I see this being one gigantic flop at the box office that is going to be the biggest goose egg Saban has ever laid next to Super Mega Force. So... Do I think it's time to lower this into the ground? Yes. Oh, by God, yes. Let's lower this thing into the ground and start pouring the concrete. It's time to let it go. If you want to check out the trailer, uh, you can. It's up on YouTube. Uh, check it out. 
I might be wrong. It might be good for you. You might like it. I doubt it, though, but I'll never know. All right, so let's get on to my final topic of the night here. Ringling Brothers is shutting down. After 146 years, the greatest show on earth is finally calling it quits. That's right, Ringling Brothers is the Ringling Brothers Circus is closing down after more than 100 years in operation, according to press release from Field Entertainment, which has owned the circus for the last 50 years. Uh, in a quote from CEO Kenneth Field, he said, and I quote, I have made the difficult business decision that Ringling Brothers and the Barnum and Bailey uh, Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey will hold its final performances in May of this year. The reason for this closure and why we're no longer going to be having the greatest show on earth. So, by the way, if you can get tickets to this, uh, I highly recommend it because uh, you're never going to see this again. Uh, according to, you know, according to Field, once again, uh, or Feld, I should say, I apologize for that, Feld, uh, high operating costs and the decline of ticket sales made the circus an unsustainable business for the company. Yeah. And it got worse. Uh, he's also quoted as saying, Af And after the transition of the elephants off the road, we saw an even more dramatic drop in ticket sales. Well, yeah, you have the elephants featured in almost all of your advertisements, all of your brochures, all, every picture you see of Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey Circus, you see the elephants. Can't have the elephants anymore. Uh, for years, the elephants and their dance routines featured prominently on the shows. But several animal rights groups report, uh, repeatedly criticized, picketed, and sued uh, Ringling Brothers for their treatment of the animals. Yeah, there was a circus um, near where I live last year. And there were rumors that protesters were going to show up and do picket lines because uh, it was the local fire department was having it because they were nice enough to forewarn the neighbors, hey, if you guys see picketers outside, you know, don't interact with them. You know, just let us know if you see any of them. That'd be really great. Because they knew why they were there, and it's like, yeah, let them show up. Uh, in 2011, Feld Entertainment agreed to pay a fine of $270,000 to the U.S. Department of Agriculture for alleged violations of the Animal Welfare Act. Uh, the company did not admit wrongdoing, but promised to implement new training for all personnel who handle animals. Yep. Uh, Ringling Brothers was founded in Barboo, Wisconsin in 1884 by five of the seven Ringling Brothers. The family ran the circus until 1967 when it was sold to Feld Entertainment, according to the Wisconsin Historical Society. So like I said, either way, it's done. After 146 years, it's over. Um, the final performances will be in May of this year. So like I said, if you can get there, if you can see this, I recommend seeing it one last time because this is something you're not... I don't even think I've seen this. I don't know. I'd have to really double check and ask my uh, mom because I know I saw a circus. I saw a couple circuses in my life, so I have to ask her what which ones exactly they were. But uh, it's really sad that a show that has gone on for this long uh, has to call it quits. I say send it off uh, in style. Make it one of the best uh, final performances. You know, go see it because it's something you're never going to see again. Because a lot of circuses are closing up. A lot of circuses aren't doing this anymore. And you can, and I don't mean any offense to PETA. I, I was going to say you can think, but you can thank a lot of the nut job animal rights activists. I don't mean any harm by this, but I mean the ones that think that uh, no animal should ever be in the world. Every single animal should be outside. No person should ever touch an animal. Those are the ones that I'm talking about. Uh, I mean no disrespect to any of them, but you do realize that there comes a time and a place when people just aren't going to listen to it anymore. So it's really sad that it's ending, um, but... Uh, 
at least it entertained people for so many years, and I say go out with a bang. And like I said, if you can, go check it out. Uh, final performances in May of this year. They'll probably have something up uh, near in the end, and you know I'll probably be reporting on it here on the podcast. All right, so I still got some time left in the podcast this week, so it's time for stories, stories from from eBay, 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 and this week's story from eBay has it's a really good one. I have to admit this. Um, once again, as always, I will not say names. All people are anonymous. All stories from eBay are anonymous. Uh, You know it happens to me, but it doesn't mean that it's going to be finding its way out there. So nobody's names will be dragged through the mud. Um, This story from eBay happened not too long ago. And um, it was for something I had up for sale. Um, I had to buy it now. Price set at around 50 bucks. Um, there was an auction price along with that, so I had it going for the good 10 days, uh, max, you can put an auction up. When, you know, when you do the auction and the buy it now, right off the bat, if you do buy it now, you can do like 30 days. So, I had a person that sent me a message. I guess they were interested in the item, and that's good. I'm always happy when someone's interested in something that I have. But... They basically sent me a message and said, well, Common Core Math says that I should only have to pay you $3 for this item. And in the back of my mind, when I'm reading this message, I'm like, Common Core? I'm like, okay. says that you should only have to pay me $3 for a $50 item. So, I said, at first I said nothing, then they sent me back another thing and said, well, are you going to take my $3 offer? I'd really like to buy this, but you don't have an offer up. You don't have an offer button. I'm waiting for you to make the, put the offer button up. And I just calmly replied back. I, I was just so nice about it. I calmly replied back, I am not going to do that. Because at this point, it already had a bid. The buy it now price was fifty dollars. The bidding price was, I think, I think it was like maybe ten or something. So it was a low starting price for the auction, and it was a high buy it now price. I, so I know it was like an action figure. That's about all I remember from it. But I just thought it was hilarious. At this person's expecting me to uh, change the thing to a buy it now just so that they can make a $3 offer and expect me to pay for this. So I stupidly had to ask, I said, so why is it exactly that Common Core Math tells you that I need to only pay the $3 for this, that you should only have to pay $3 for this? Well, because all the words in your description uh, demenialize the value of it. Okay. Not happening, though. And that was where I left the conversation then. So that's definitely one of my weirder uh, stories from eBay. So if anybody out there knows Common Core Math uh, and can explain that to me as to how that made a $50 item now a $3 item, all because I put words in the description, please feel free to message me. And believe it or not, I get a lot of stupid messages every now and then. From people, and the majority of the time, uh, either the eBay system automatically flags them, or I just ignore them, because they're like really stupid questions, or they're just something that the person's asking it. I think they're either doing it to be a smart ass, what have you. So I, I get a lot of that because I have some stuff up on Craigslist, and I have a lot of those stupid questions too. But this one was eBay, and that's what I found uh, hilarious about that. So, yep. So now my time is almost up this week for the absolutely completely random podcast. It has been a lot of fun. Like always, I am your host, Andrew Rhodes, saying if you'd like to sponsor the podcast, you know I can use some extra money and helps pay the bills and I can improve the podcast then. Uh, if you'd like to sponsor the podcast, if you have any ideas on ways I can improve on the podcast, if you have any questions you'd like to ask me that could possibly make their way onto the podcast, 
or if you would just like to say hi, send me an email at acrpodcast at gmail.com. That's, once again, acrpodcast at gmail.com. And until next week, I am Andrew Rhodes saying goodbye, so long, Alvita Shane, and I will catch you all next week on the 28th. Bye, everybody!